typical set routine. My mother would pick up my sister Prisha from ice skating and me from home. And all the way to school, we would pour over morning prayer and the Janison book that hid in the back pocket of our front two seats. All the while, my mom would have my nana or my grandfather on call or on FaceTime and attached to the dashboard. He would often quiz us on the words and their meaning. And I would respond with the same few sentences I had memorized about Janison that I kept stashed in the back of my head. You see, for a long while, Janison held little to no meaning for me. It was more so a routine, a tedious task in which I had to memorize these random phrases, or in which I would have to go to the dedication, the small dedication in our house and say thank you before going to school, or in which I would just say namo arigatou before going to bed, because of according to my mother, if I didn't, my next day would be cursed. Now, I'm not so sure how much that last part is true, but Jainism as I know it now is a minority religion practiced by some six million people worldwide. It's based in Rajasthan and Gujarat, India, and it promotes nonviolence towards plants and animals. What that means is not only am I a vegetarian, but I'm also technically not supposed to be having any vegetables. You see, if you were to pluck an orange from a tree, you're not killing the whole tree, but if you were to pick a potato from the ground, you're killing the plant. Not only does Jainism promote nonviolence towards plants and animals, but it also promotes minimalism and acceptance of love of all forms. Jainism is commonly known as one of the most peaceful religions. But what is religion anyway? I believe we often view it based off of propaganda rather than what it should be. Something to hold on to for yourself, to find community within for yourself, to find connection with for yourself. I emphasize for yourself because too often we use our own religion, our own religious connection, to govern other people's lives and their life choices when religion at its core should be individualistic. When I was 13, my mom and I traveled to the latter I put city of Agra, just boarded with Taj Mahal for the recent passing of a family member. At the puja, the priest gathered us around, and he began speaking. But speaking of what, I did not know. And it was with that knowledge that I sat in the corner, an outsider, an intruder upon their collective grief. And across the room, a guttural cry pierced the air, and the mother collapsed, as, gasping as if she were buried under monsoon floods, thrashing to no avail and crying for help, only to have her lungs filled with thick rain. She screamed silence, and she clawed at her skin, and she shook with all the loss only a mother could feel. And I wanted to comfort her. Of course I did. I wanted to comfort my grandparents, my family. But I couldn't speak the language. And weirdly now, I'm grateful I could not have offered more than physical touch. Because if I could have, I would have said something like, he's looking down on us and he's smiling from above. You see, that's how I was taught at Exeter and around it in America to speak about grief. And though I didn't put it together at the time, Jainism does not believe in heaven. It believes in karma. Karma in the sense that you were reborn in a form based on of how much good you did in your previous life. The truth was, my personal search of and personal relationship to Jainism was always limited. It was always limited in a campus environment where four or less people identified as Jain. It was always limited in a place where the nearest Jain temple is over four hours away, and it was always limited in a society that hears Jain and thinks Jain, J-A-N. Presence fosters community and connection, but the issue here was not only representation, it was also the mindset I entered my search for a religious connection with. One that was structured by rigidity, and by believing that anything outside of the realm of perfect was wrong. In America, religion often follows a strict doctrine. There are good, blank, and there are bad, blank. And I never truly allowed myself to identify as Jane, nor did I really, um, I allowed myself a religious connection with Jainism because I didn't follow everything it espoused, and because of the way that I'd been conditioned to view religion as a box. If you've ever considered somebody wasn't Christian, Buddhist, Muslim, Christian, etc., then you've fallen into the same trap. We must keep in mind how not only unifying religion is, but how it functions singularly. 
Roughly two months after my trip to Agra, I was in Palatana during India's monsoon season with my nani, or my grandfather, for Jane's pilgrimage. His feet were bare, but mine were clothed, and I spent the hours long walk up fearful of what I was stepping in. Just halfway through the pilgrimage, we can no longer see some 800 Jain temples spreading out from the base of the Jihar mountain. While he recited the Thunkras, I wrung out my jacket relentlessly, wiped the water from my brow, searched for nearby sticks to help me with the 18 mile climb, and massaged the pain on the back of my calf. The brutal cold numbed my fingers, and I worried we would not make it there before night fell. I knew we were finally nearing the end when we caught sight of a small restaurant off the side of the path cleared by years of James making their way to the original Thunkras, the original souls. And at this restaurant, my nana pulls me to the back corner, to the back table, and orders a cup of chai. And he decides to talk me through the core values of Jainism. He speaks of minimalism, to which I think of my 60k a year school, where students walked around with Canada Goose jackets and AirPods. He spoke of nonviolence towards plants, to which I thought of the bag of potato chips I'd had just earlier that morning. So maybe I don't follow everything about Jainism, and maybe I don't follow anything but nonviolence towards animals and love of queer love, and maybe that's okay. And that's why Nanu remained my biggest supporter for so long. He understood that following things outside of the, the, scale, the scope of your religion does not necessarily negate your religious connection. We don't have to follow all of it to characterize ourselves, characterize ourselves as religious. Rather, religion should be a method of connection. On January 25th of this year, my nana passed away. He had contracted COVID roughly six months earlier and had been battling it ever since. My nana was never one to attend events or to go see friends during a pandemic. Rather, he made one, just one short excursion every morning. He went downstairs to the temple, just below his apartment in his house, that roughly three people frequented. Just 30 minutes in and out, he would go to pray, just as he did 6 a.m. every day for as long as he could remember. It's ironic that for all the karma that Jainism espouses, and for all that we believe God to be, my daughter passed away making one short trip to the temple every day a short trip to a place that nobody went to, but that mattered to him so much. And at first I was angry, furious, that my religion had led me to believe that if you were good by God's standards, good by Jane's standards, you'd be treated in a good way. But at the end of the day, I ended up turning to God, as we do during our highs and lows, and as we inevitably do during our grieving. My relationship with religion depends on necessity, or when I'm most aware of it. And though the presence of Jainism is constant and never changing in my life, my relationship to it is a roller coaster. And rather than being criticized for the so-called bad following, and rather than this being characterized as non-religious, we must challenge this rigid view that our relationship to faith must be constant. Faith isn't perfect. It's something to hold on to when our lives are chaotic. You know, I have a friend who recently told me that she wants to search a religious connection. Something to hold on to amidst this pandemic. Something to keep herself tethered to while our lives are virtually uncontrollable. In a search for whatever you're looking for, I urge you to ask yourself for some leeway. Our commitment is not measured by our constancy. It's measured by our effort. 